There's something especially powerful about a short, simple story told well. Think about the fairy tales and bedtime stories your parents shared with you in your childhood. Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince and a beautiful princess. Or the kinds of spooky stories whispered around the campfire at night. And then he jumped out of the woods and his head fell off. <laughs> Something in those moments leaves us totally focused and captivated. Edgar Allan Poe, known for his short stories and poems written in the mid-1800s, had this to say about the power of a short story. If any literary work is too long to be read at one sitting, we must be content to dispense with the immensely important effect derivable from unity of impression. For if two sittings be required, the affairs of the world interfere, and everything like totality is at once destroyed. In simpler terms, if a story is so long that you can't read it all at once, then something's lost by the time you come back to finish it. Although I don't totally agree, I think there's a lot of truth to what he's saying. There's something about experiencing a story from start to finish all at once that has a big impact on us. And that's one thing that I love about movies, and especially short films. If you only have a few minutes to tell a story, you can't waste any time. Pixar is an awesome example of a studio that consistently tells great stories through their feature-length animated films. <coughs> Some exceptions. And their short films are equally impressive. Pixar's latest short is only about six minutes long and includes no dialogue. And to tell you the truth, I think it's more powerful than a lot of the movies you see at the top of the box office these days. La Luna, Pixar's latest in a lineup of theatrical short films, was shown last year before every screening of their latest feature film, Brave. Let's go through an overview of the plot so we can revel in its overwhelming simplicity together. Three people, a boy, his father, and his grandfather, drift across the ocean in a rowboat. They give the boy a hat, the moon rises next to them, the boy climbs up toward the moon and secures the anchor so the others can come up too. The boy touches a star. They get some tools out. A big star crash lands on the moon's surface. They fight about it and try to move it. The boy hammers it and it breaks into pieces. They sweep the star pieces to the side to create a crescent moon. How adorable. Now, something I've noticed time and time again when I hear people talking about movies these days is that they seem to get all caught up talking about plot details. Normally, it kind of sounds like this. So, Andrew, how was the movie this weekend? Oh, well, uh, it was good. Uh, it was about this girl, and she went back in time because her family was all messed up. But it turns out she just made things worse because her dad had already gone back in time to try to fix things. And so they both went way in the future and to see how the future selves was doing. And uh, it turned out their future selves was dead. So they tried to fix the machine, but... When you watch La Luna, it gives you no excuse to just list off the plot points because there's not much of a plot to talk about. And remember, there's no dialogue in this film. No actual words are spoken between characters. So, because the story is so short, simple, and to the point, it forces you to move under the surface and into the subtext. That is, looking at a character's actions, interactions, motives, feelings, and connecting those dots to create meaning. And that's a lot more interesting than just rehashing plot points. It turned out they were in the wrong dimension and stuff, so they had to go just back to the present. So let's walk through the story again, step by step, this time really thinking about what's happening on screen, and maybe we'll discover something great. Let's start at the beginning. And pause. 10 seconds in and we already have stuff to talk about. Right away, the setting is being established. It looks like we're in the middle of the ocean at night. Now, what can we say about the ocean? Well, it's vast, seemingly limitless, and also, it's easy to feel lost when you're drifting at sea, especially at night. 
Along with the setting, our characters have been introduced. A boy, a man, and an older man are sitting together in a boat. And looking at the boy's behavior, we can tell that this is a new experience for him. The next part of the scene sets up some interesting relationships between the characters. The older man hands some sort of gift to the boy, and it turns out to be a hat. Here, we kind of notice that they're all wearing the same clothes, and the two men are already wearing the same hat. Next, we see the two men trying to make the boy wear the hat to match their own style. I can't help but feel some family-like tensions going on here. Turns out, that's what the filmmakers are trying to convey. In the end credits, our characters are listed as Bambino, Papa, and Nono, which translate in Italian to baby, father, and grandfather. Interesting. So we have three generations here. And typical of a child looking up to his elders, we see the boy imitating the gestures of both men. Then, suddenly, the moon rises before them in all its majesty. Oh boy! Pixar is so awesome! Pixar is so great! It's already starting to get really interesting. Now, you'll recall that the title of this film is La Luna, which also happens to be the name of the boat in the story. So, what does La Luna translate to in English? You guessed it. The moon! At this point, it's pretty obvious that the moon is an important idea in this story. Yes, as part of the plot, as we already know, but more importantly, as part of the theme or controlling idea. As a symbol, the moon has often been considered a place of confusion and indecision. In fact, words like lunacy and lunatic are derived from the word luna, but I don't think we're dealing with anything quite that extreme in this case. So we have the moon, we have the ocean, what's so confusing and disorienting about what's going on here? Well, let's take a look at our characters again. The boy certainly seems to be stuck between the two men, literally and figuratively speaking. And as we've seen by their actions, the older men are both trying to influence the boy based on their own ways of doing things. As a result, the boy really doesn't know how to act. His identity is at stake. And that's true for all of us too, right? When we're young, our parents and teachers are all trying to shape us to think and act in a certain way. And when they disagree about how to shape us, we feel torn apart. Well, that's part one. Um, part two is right there. I mean, right over there. Part two, you can go ahead and give that a click. Looks pretty good, I mean, I think it's good. Oh. I mean, I'm not gonna force you to click or anything, but... I mean, you wanna... Explore the rest of the story with me, right? Well, get to the end. Go ahead and click, click on part two. Huh. I mean, it's right there. You know what? I'm going to part two, I, I don't know about you. I'm going to part two, see ya. Just kidding.